Welcome to the second faculty professional development lecture of the fall 22 semester exemplary classes at CCS. Today, we will hear from liberal arts adjunct faculty member Russell Jones and fashion design chair Aki Chocolate. Um, jumping into our bios here. Aki is chair of the fashion design program and holds an MA from the Royal College of Art. In addition to his works with brands such as Latizet and Diverso, he helped establish and lead the footwear and accessories master program at Polimoda, Italy's leading fashion school. He has also taught at the London College of Fashion and De Montfort University. He is the author of several books, including footwear design. Russell Jones, who will be our first presenter today, um, is an adjunct faculty member of the Liberal Arts Program um, and teaches classes on African and Asian art history at CCS and other colleges in the Detroit Toledo area, where he also teaches modern and contemporary art. He has an art history MA from Bowling Green State University and is interested in artistic practices that fall outside of the traditional art canon. His thesis focused on graffiti sub subculture. So with those introductions out of the way, I'd like to uh, introduce our first presenter of the day, Russell Jones. Hello all, nice to see you here. Um, so I'll do a share screen so I can start my presentation. Have to look through my reading glasses some because of my old eyes. Okay. Okay, so visual narration, Africa and diaspora, um, outcomes and pedagogy. So this is actually a little bit tricky to read with the way that I Zoom is working. So let me see if I can move this around a little bit. Okay, that works better. Um, so the class is supposed to be about um, teaching and about how we get to outcomes. Um, so um, I list some of the outcomes here. Some of them are basic outcomes that everybody uses for my class, visual narration, um, Africa and the diaspora. Uh, but the first one is mine. So reveal and challenge fundamental, often invisible beliefs about cultures of Africa, the diaspora, and one's own culture. Uh, recognize and critique the environmental, cultural, social, and historical factors of various civilizations and or periods and the impact of those factors. Um, also compare and contrast specific works of art in terms of style, artists, socio-cultural context, et cetera, uh, and apply the knowledge to uh, make a five-page writing. So how I build these outcomes throughout the class uh, is kind of step by step. So first thing is practice art criticism by doing, which is literally the first thing they do in class uh, after introductions, which I'll show you in a bit. Form and content analysis. Um, in class assignments and discussions that reveal and challenge assumptions based in white supremacy and Western imperialism of the global majority. Understanding academic language through application, reading the point of view of black scholars, critics, and audiences, and sorry, I have to move this out of the way, learning to create arguments. So some of the theoretical and conceptual uh, bases for um, what I do in the class is Afro-pessimism, and this isn't a particular order, intersectionality and identity, orientalism, uh, talking about Edward Said's Orientalism, gender performance, decolonization and African and Black nationalism, racialism and colorism, and positionality. Um, so my pedagogical inspiration are a couple of teachers. I mean, I could go on forever, but I'll just name a couple. One is Ruth Herndon, um, when I was an undergraduate at University of Toledo. Uh, and what she had us do was an in-class assignment every day. Um, there would be an introduction to the period uh, this is colonial history class. And then we would work with primary sources. Um, and these in-class assignments would be in groups and we would have a thing that we'd write in turn every day. And what I got out of this is that practicing um, is really important and it's important to do it right away. And then Andrew Hersberger, who was one of my teachers at Bowling Green, um, he used, uh, at that time, not a lot of people were using um, LMS 
but in this case it was Blackboard, but he used it and he had an extra credit board. Uh, so I've been using that in all of my teaching. Uh, and that's the first thing I go over in class every day. Um, and since I don't really have a section about the extra credit board, um, going back to the previous slide, um, some of these ideas which come out, especially about racialism and colorism, the students will bring those ideas out through the extra credit board. They'll post a video that's a conversation, uh, maybe about hair or about colorism, uh, and then we'll have the discussion in class. So I find that once I get started with the things I'm gonna show you today, uh, that the extra credit board starts filling in the things that I need to do later in the class. And that's coming from the students themselves. So first day uh, after introductions, and I read a small part of the syllabus just to let them know um, how the assignments are weighted, um, I do this and I give them no information whatsoever. Uh, and when I remember when I first started doing this, I thought it was just a basic compare and contrast. But what I realized is that it was revealing that first outcome that I was talking about, uh, challenging uh, fundamental beliefs about African and black cultures, and also fundamental beliefs that they have about their own culture. So it's just a compare and contrast. And I emphasize to the students um, to be as basic as possible. Uh, in other words, don't be afraid to say what they might think is obvious. And I give them about 10 minutes to do this. Uh, and I refuse, I tell them, I'm going to refuse to tell them what they're seeing here. And when we start to have the discussion, oftentimes the students uh, will talk about each piece uh, and they'll use certain types of adjectives. And I'll challenge them what they mean by those adjectives. Uh, one of the most common ones is they'll look at this piece. Um, I'm assuming you all can see my cursor, the piece on the right. And they'll say that it looks tribal. Um, so I ask them, what do, what do they mean by that? Uh, you know, what are you trying to say? Um, so once we do that, uh, and we have a little bit of a discussion, then I have them do a diagnostic. And again, they've done nothing in the class other than this, this is the first thing they do. Uh, and then the diagnostic, um, they're just writing a three paragraph thing uh, with a basic form of an academic paper that they'll have to do later on. Uh, so a thesis statement, um, supporting evidence, uh, and then an argument that explains the wider significance. Then they turn that in um, and we go on break. <laughs> and then when they come back from break, I say, you can ask me questions about either of the pieces. I admit that the piece on the left, I don't know a whole lot about because academic art isn't really my thing, um, but they do ask lots of questions about the one on the right. So what's interesting is whenever I get these um, assignments back, what I found was something else that, was, that I didn't suspect. Um, and that was more of those adjectives that kind of revealed uh, some of these kind of fundamental beliefs that people have that they may not be aware of. Um, so this is a pretty good example right here from a few semesters ago. Um, and I just took um, their writings and took some of the adjectives or descriptive words that they had. Uh, so you can see uh, for Africa, they would use the word tribal, uh, and then I couldn't really find an equivalent uh, for the European uh, artwork. Uh, high rank, high rank, most people recognize that because of the details. Rough, calm, aggressive, solemn, strong to elegance. Uh, and what I found was this was like really revealing um, what students um, had, their kind of fundamental assumptions about African cultures and arts before they even started. So what became even more interesting is this semester, I found that the students uh, were much more nuanced uh, and much more able to kind of read um, a, lang a cultural language that they may not be familiar with. And were able to come up with some very interesting conclusions that turned out to be uh, correct. Um, so this next slide, it's got a lot of words. So if you're on a small screen, maybe you can't see them. But that's kind of representing how much more nuanced it was this semester. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating because you see, you do see some of those um, kind of dichotomies that uh, could show like a certain amount of uh, internalized white supremacy, uh, but you don't see it as much this semester. Um, you see, I was able to find a lot of the same descriptive words on each side uh, and students were able to read um, things like reading that these were of high status, 
uh, in the African one, um, finding jewelry and adornment, um, talking about um, patterns and what that means. Uh, so this assignment's a diagnostic, a writing diagnostic, but it's also a diagnostic of kind of where students need to go. Um, and this semester, it was kind of impressive how uh, this step is farther along than what I've had with students in previous semesters. So on the following day, I do an introduction to African art. And I explain to the students that's impossible to do because there is no African art. Uh, there's a thousand cultures. Um, so we have quite a build up to this. Uh, and when I get to this slide, it's another in a class assignment. Um, and it's some derogatory words that are no longer used to describe African art and culture. And I start with tribe and tribal, primitive, native, native magic, witch doctor, savage, fetish, bushman, and naive. Um, and this is what I generally do in later classes. I have them in groups uh, and I set it up to try to answer these questions. Um, but one group member would be assigned right when they get together uh, to turn in notes. Um, and then another one is to make sure that everybody talks, which is important. Uh, and then another one will present to the class. Then afterwards, I have them turn in the notes um, and um, we discuss it in the class. Uh, so it becomes a very interesting discussion because students get into the nuances of positionality, which I mentioned, especially when it comes to the words like tribe or tribal. Um, and again, I've seen some kind of interesting results. Um, I haven't talked about Orientalism yet in the class, yet the students are almost quoting and reciting with some of these um, results that I'm seeing. So this is just a result highlight uh, from what the students had turned in. Um, so native tribal savage makes it seem as though these people aren't civil. They need to be saved or taught. Reinforces colonialism. Um, people are going to educate. Uh, assumes these artists, people are not civilized or progressive. Again, like shades of Edward Said. Uh, doesn't encompass the full scope of perspective and experiences attached connotations, waters down the art, justifies imperialism, colonialism, white savior complex, which will come up again in the class, and using insulting terminology to foster shame, um, convincing black people to assimilate. Um, so all of these, again, I thought were pretty fascinating. Um, so the last one I'm gonna talk about is kind of how uh, I start to integrate um, scholarship into the class. Uh, because often the barrier with scholarship is that students don't understand the language use. Uh, so in the case of this one, we're talking about Gada Amer, who's the Egyptian artist, and they just did this a few weeks ago, um, and the Turkish bath, <laughs> another coincidental um, kind of reference to Uru Said, I think, here uh, through Anga. Uh, so what I do is I set up this particular section where I'm talking about contemporary artists from Egypt and Sudan, um, and the first artist I talk about from Egypt is Gazbi Asuri uh, and Gada Amir. And I'd actually set up my class this way a long time ago, but a few years ago, I found an article from Okeke Gulu, who is a Nigerian artist. He's now at Princeton um, and art historian. Uh, and he wrote a really interesting article about the two of them um, and situated it in the political environment of, um, I'm starting to run out of time, but I do, I will be good. Um, so kind of situating it in the political environment. And I give them a lot of, especially with Gatsby of Surrey and her Metamorphosis series from 1968, I give them a lot of history and kind of describe um, how, you know, kind of reactionary forces in Egypt have changed the culture uh, since the Nasser, Nasser revolution. Um, so I use quotes from Akeke Ugulu in this part, uh, but some of them are kind of difficult for the students to get. So I read this quote, in other words, uh, and something I need to mention, Gada Amir, what she does is these combinations of painting and embroidery. Uh, and one of her main subjects is using pornography, exclusively showing images of women from her pornography starting in the early nineties, but she still uses pornographic magazines for these images. You can kind of see a shade in this detail of what I'm talking about. Um, and in it, um, Okeke Agulu kind of locates um, this type of um, this type of work 
and why these images are sexualized and how they would relate to something that Gata Amara is very interested in, which is veiling um, in Egypt. Um, as a side note, uh, this particular artist was chosen originally in a modern contemporary class that I did. And how I chose the contemporary artists in that class was I handed the students a bunch of um, art magazines and I said, pick something, get some quotes from one of the articles, and then that's what we're going to cover in this class. Uh, and the woman that I had chosen, Gata Amer, um, actually wore the veil. This was over at Henry Ford. Um, so an interesting side note. So in other words, by populating her canvases with unveiled women, Amer seems to suggest that both pornography and veiling participate in the scopophilia, the sexualization of the female body. So I define scopophilia for them, um, and I ask them what they think this means. Um, and generally, that's a difficult question. So what I go to is try to relate it to their experience. I ask the students, how many of you have been cited for a dress code violation in high school or junior high? And immediately a third to a half of the FEM students' hands go up. So I ask them, um, so what did you get cited for? Uh, invariably, I wish it would change, but it hasn't changed over the years. Invariably, it would be um, the straps. I was wearing a tank top and the straps were too thin. Um, I had holes in my jeans and the holes were too high up on my leg. Um, I had a skirt and it was too short. Um, my clothes were too tight. Um, part of my belly button was showing. Uh, and I asked them, well, why? What's the problem with this? Uh, some of you are wearing tank tops today. Why is this a problem? Um, and they start to explore why they think it's a problem. Um, I asked them, what did they say? Why did they say that, that these violations happen? And they said, well, it was distract um, the boys. And I said, why? They can't pay attention to their own things. Um, and then I start to talk about, um, I ask them, well, did the boys get cited if they wear a tank top? Um, and they say, no. And I'm like, what about if they're outside, um, you know, in gym class or something and they take their shirt off? Are they gonna be cited? And they say, no. Um, and after this conversation, they start to understand what the quote is about, uh, about how covering and also revealing um, is about the sexualization of the female body. We also try to get into um, a little bit of the subtleties between sexualization and object objectification because Gata Amara picks these images, she says, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, to take back sensuality for women. Um, so she's, and she also says, I pick images that I find sexy. Um, so this becomes very subtle. And when we talk about the veil, it also becomes very subtle because uh, Gata Mera has a piece later on um, where she uh, did photography with some women that wore the veil in Paris and talking about the kind of persecution that women have there. So again, this is about locating things, bringing things down to earth so students can understand it. Um, so that's just kind of the beginning of the class. So the conclusions, how do we build these outcomes? Taking students step-by-step step to build confidence and skills, having uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> First day to get the, the white students to say the word black is very difficult. Uh, bringing academic scholarship down to earth and applicable. So in other words, showing them how it applies to their own lives encouraging ownership of the class, especially for black students. Since I'm a white guy teaching this class, um, that's very important. And I make that clear from the very beginning that this is for, especially for the black students and this, that they can take ownership of this class. Um, so that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Russell. That was great. Now um, we will turn it over to Aki. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, let me set my timer on because, you know, I need a little help with that. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And um, thank you again, everybody who's in this um, in this meeting. And I will um, talk about um, the way we, well, the, the, the way I uh, teach and what I believe in, and um, just as kind of a uh, disclo disclosure is that I fully trust that my faculty and my adjuncts um, have the best possible way of teaching their classes. 
but I do know that we share quite a bit of similar um, similar ways of thinking. So just a moment, and I did clean my desktop just for this moment. Uh, and again, let me know if if there's any kind of a problems with sound or 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 visuals. So I really had a when this topic was sent to me, and I really uh, had a, had to have a bit of a think uh, what to say, um, uh, how to present this, and the the main the main thing that came to my mind is that I really have to understand what our department stands for. And I really have to, we've been working on a kind of a department uh, mission statement. And we finally came to one. It's still a little bit a uh, work in progress, but um, this is what our mission statement is. Um, our CCS fashion department mission is to train students for national and international success in all aspects of fashion. By combining the fundamentals of construction with the exuberance of conceptual thinking, our students will find their own pathway and methods to unlock their full potential. Through exploring responsible thinking, designing and making with a fundamental understanding of themselves, as well as the community they desire to address, our new era thinkers are encouraged to excel within the fashion industry and beyond. So this was a really important starting point uh, for me thinking, how do we deliver education to students so they can be this, what the mission statement says. Now, I can only speak kind of a, from my own um, a method, and it's pretty much always based on, whether it's lecture or studio class, it's based on the idea of research, which is a huge topic. It could be a five hour lecture, the idea of development, what does that mean, and the process. And in this is the instance, research is always important, um, in my opinion, for students to uh, kind of a dip deeper into their topics of, of, of research and not take too many uh, influences from Instagram and, and, and other, you know, TikToks, et cetera. Development is about the actual, you know, drawing, uh, et cetera. And in our department, the process is about creating the final pieces. So I will go through that a little bit more in detail shortly. Now I teach uh, two, two, two things. I teach a lecture, and I, st I teach studio. And I have to say that during these uh, COVID years, I learned so much about how to engage students through this little screen that we are all staring at right now. And I actually brought the same methods into classroom. Um, it is far easier, at least for me, to teach face-to-face -face in a classroom, even if it's a lecture topic and you don't need to be in a studio making. It's just uh, there's something about physicality and physical language being in the vicinity of students uh, that makes the three hours fly by, whereas in Zoom call, um, it's a struggle to go beyond, you know, hour and a half or even an hour sometimes. So I have examples of both uh, from the lecture class I teach actually next semester and the studio classes I've been teaching. So one important uh, thing for me is always to define um, the terms that uh, we use, that I use in the class, because uh, first of all, not being a native English speaker, I just want to make sure that there's a full uh, understanding in English, what we talk about. And in my other institutions, we had a lot of um, foreign uh, international students, and it was always interesting to kind of a define words in their languages as well, because it just brought an incredible depth into conversation. Once we had a topic um, for one of our classes, um, the word void and what void meant in Arabic, in Spanish, in English, in Hebrew, it was like really great uh, conversation. It, in fact, it took a whole class, a classroom time to kind of find a good definition for that. So, we start with um, um, dictionary, uh, sorry. Uh, so we, we start with the dictionary definition, uh, which I will go into a little bit deeper. And we also, I always in fashion, you, you cannot dismiss um, historical um, development and uh, perspective because 
lot of the things that we work on, somebody has invented. Uh, there's a historical reason why they exist, even from all, all of our items of clothing. So historical perspective is always um, in all of my classrooms, uh, a section of, 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 of the teaching. Uh, and Russell, your lecture was really interesting because it just brought so many questions. So we have to have a you know meeting after or, or later as well. Uh, so research. With all the studio and lecture classes, it always starts in the library. And I'm not saying this because I was invited to do this lecture by the library, but we always have our first or second lesson uh, research session in the library. I'm just a firm believer that you can find so much more information from books rather than from a Google. And you are simply a better human being if you are friends with books or magazines or publications. That's the number one thing for me. And we always have a beautiful time in the library and um, it would be great if we could spend every session there, but obviously this is not a possibility. So but what the research is, it's uh, two, two kind of a things in, in, um, in our, our world. Um, can be you know a text based or or well it is text based and also it's visual it's it's both of those things so with the sort of a um, I hate to use the 2D and 3D because it can be so much but when I talk about 2D I'm talking about like flat surfaces and you know paper and walls but the students in our design studios they have to always write a statement of intent and it's just really good to get them, they're very eager to go and pin and cut and create things, but it's really good also to kind of sit down and just write down your thoughts, uh, what the possible ideas is that, they can, that they're concerned with, uh, they, they want to do. It's this really helpful kind of a conversation piece uh, also, when you when you meet with students one on one, you can you can reference that. So we always start start with this, uh, whether it's a studio class or um, lecture class. So um, with studio classes, especially, there is always the situation of mood boards. Uh, it just really helps um, the student. It really helps me to understand what the direction is that the students are going. I, I wish we had enough wall space in our studio that every student could do a mood board, but we have to kind of have to limit, limit it to, you know, our collection design class for second years because wall spaces take, you know, it takes a lot of wall space to do a mood board. But we also have started to do digital uh, mood boards and kind of represent them in the classroom, uh, maybe more sustainable. Ian, I know you're thinking, oh, waste of paper. But um, regardless, you know, as long as we can communicate the ideas, um, again, a great tool for conversation. Um, we love conversations, you know, we're, we're humans. Um, figital is the word I absolutely detest, but it is what it is and it exists. So uh, it is the combination of the two uh, we do. We can have a smaller space for sort of physical items to touch, and then we can have uh, unlimited space in, in the digital world. Now, um, in this in the sort of a 2D narrative, uh, sketching is uh, obviously really important, and we always uh, start with sketching. Students are very many students are very not comfortable with sketching, but we always say that just make your mark, um, express your ideas. Uh, it's not a competition, you know, who's the best sketcher, etc. It's just really important to get your ideas into some kind of a material. Um, going from 2D, we always go to 3D and we go to uh, actual objects and it's it's what all my studio classes, I, I teach design, I don't teach technical things. I mean, there are far more skilled and professional people who can teach, you know, uh, utmost level of accessories making. So I, my studio classes is about how to get your research ideas into a final product. So we, st we start with paper, we start with muslin, we start with um, sort of a more disposable materials just to get the first volumes up and see how they work. And we've gotten incredible uh, feedback from other, from, from US companies on the level of our students' work. And I've been trying to understand like why, like I, I 
I can't compare myself to the great design schools in the world, but now I'm starting to think that maybe we can. And I think it's that we do so many samples and developments before the, the final product. So I think that's kind of like our secret. Well, not so much of a secret now because this is going to be published in, uh, in YouTube. So uh, this is a quick lecture example of on teaching fashion trends next semester. Um, so taking into this sort of a ideas into into account so we define you know we define terms what does fashion mean and it's easy for one to say like oh it's the stuff i wear well it's far more complicated than that so we look at the dictionary definition and then we look at other sort of academic reference definitions and then in the end we kind of define in the classroom ourselves what this means same thing with word trend which I absolutely think needs to be changed because it sounds very cheap, but again, it is what it is. So there's a dictionary definition of the word trend. Um, so we discuss this. We also discuss it in a more contemporary sense and what it means. Then we go into, well, what is the history of, uh, of, of trends? Um, is there a history of trends? And of course there is. So I always, I'm a little hesitant to bring like my collection of artifacts and books and things I have. So uh, I try to show them, I have this um, 1678 uh, fashion quote unquote magazine that is already kind of a trend forecast because it talks about what people wore in the French court. So I try to take pictures of everything I have. And if there's time, sometimes I bring this thing to the classroom, but I feel like photos is, is okay in this instance. Um, I also have a lot of other references from, from, from history. And then another thing that, because I'm just kind of a paranoid, I don't want to say like, oh, this person, blah, 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 said this. And I really do the utmost to try to find the original article and I actually found this article and I found the magazine on eBay. So I share this information with students. I used to do this in Zoom, but now I also do it in the classroom, sort of in the video screens behind while I'm talking that, oh, this lady called Toby was the first trend forecaster in the world. Blah, 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 blah. So I know this might look like a circus for some, but I just wanted to make a um, really exciting sort of a multi uh, faceted um, lecture and lesson for students, because don't forget, this is lecture class. I also um, love infographics, um, so I'm taking some things from my books, and then finally in the classes I always put the links and the references to various uh, websites, etc., for students to to further further study these items. So um, I have a studio example. The studio example is following the similar kind of a philosophy. Uh, we start with you know. 2D, which is uh, the mood boards, etc. I, I have kind of a mood board of the month. Uh, uh, it's not really a competition, but students do notice. So I put that on social media, and um, Hayden, uh, I think I think he did like amazing job uh, last semester with with his mood board. Um, it just made total sense what he was uh, doing in in the classroom. So, um, so mood mood board can be many things, and it's. Um, goes from visuals to actual materials. Now, I started doing something new um, this semester, and some of the students didn't really like it, but I'm kind of like, I don't care, because I think this is a good moment to test something. So uh, we are doing a Carhartt sponsor project, and the mood board had to be constructed from visual references that the students have taken themselves. So no Google images, no uh, scans from books. They had to actually either create material themselves, take photos themselves, or draw uh, themselves. And this is a kind of a photo collage by our international exchange student, uh, Hanno from Finland. So the results were actually really amazing. And I think I will continue uh, doing this uh, a little bit just to see, you know, it's, it's one thing to go to the computer and type in words, but it's another thing when you actually go out there and start thinking like what, what my, my idea is this, how, how can I select things from my environment that reflect that idea? 
So um, yeah, so this is something something new, and maybe this is a kind of a practice that I would love to get feedback from from other uh, people in this in this room. Um, and of course, you know, we have the classical sketchbook um, as well. And uh, it's just a nice sort of a object to have, uh, regardless. Uh, I have all my sketchbooks from from my Royal College uh, era, and. Yeah, some of them is like real crap, but some of them is still pretty uh, interesting. I would love to continue working on. So with 3D in our studios, uh, like I said earlier, we use a lot of paper. Uh, we use a lot of muslin and uh, images look one thing in flat. But then when you start actually working on them, on the shoe lasts and on the on the body, it becomes a whole whole other thing. So um, from 2D to 3D is a really important uh, step uh, in our department. So here we have kind of a paper uh, version on the left. Uh, we have one of our um, upcycling class uh, where students were given a gift uh, card to go to um, sort of a charity shop to buy to buy clothes. It's a um, they're doing amazing work and you know just just to show that we we do all you know it can also be fun to do these kind of things and test how things fit etc um in the end we want to prepare the students for the real world and again 20 minutes to dive into our our methods is you know not long but ultimately the students will prepare themselves for our final show, which uh, we've had two so far, and we're working on the third one um, already, uh, April 20th. And the, the final show is really about putting it all together, just like the song says. Uh, it's about styling, it's about fit, it's about look, it's about um, delivery, and it really is. Uh, somebody told me that we we have um, we have a department where we create dreams. You know, it's really about having. A, you know, it can be a meaningful conversation in the catwalk of, about the about the outfit, but it can also be you know about the fantasy of of the better better future. So I have a little clip from our last um, last show, and then I will be right on time. At one minute and thirty eight seconds left. So That's uh, that's me, and um, I also would like to, in the end, thank uh, for all the other departments that make it possible for my students to really excel in the world. It's not just about our mood boards; it's also about crafts department, fiber and textiles, graphic design, um, communication design, uh, all, all, all of it. So, and there's my timer. Thank you. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Jackie. Yeah, thank you. All right. Oh, Brooke, are you? Go ahead, Becca. Okay, sorry, um, a little confusion. So thank you to Russell and Aki for uh, your great presentations. Um, we have a few questions in the chat to start with. If um, anyone else has questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and we can um, call on you to unmute yourself. So Russell, do you wanna start with um, Ian's question? 
I can read it out in case people haven't had a chance to see that. So um, it's about the word, um, the word for art in African culture, that there is not a word for that and how um, we can redefine the term that um, people are using to create um, human artifice. Um, okay, so I thought that was an excellent question because it's something that comes up. My thesis is actually, um, the subtitle is, is um, why graffiti is not art. Uh, and part of the reason why is because I'm, um, art has a series of associations um, especially in um, the so-called Western world uh, that don't necessarily match the way that um, certain kinds of visual cultures are practiced. Um, so with my, without getting into too much detail with my thesis, uh, I came to the conclusion and some of the, the people that I interviewed, the graffiti writers I interviewed also believe the same thing, uh, that art isn't the right word. Interestingly, um, a few weeks ago, I teach the exact same class um, about African art in, over at Henry Ford and a student who was also a student here um, had mentioned that uh, in one of the um, online discussion boards because that's online only about how art isn't the right word. Um, it doesn't fit um, and in a way like the way that it's defined is um, entangled with white supremacy in such a way that you can't, it's a barrier to understanding what you're looking at. Um, and there would be another thing I would say, I would, I mean, it's really difficult to say that all African cultures don't have a word for art. I would disagree with that. Um, however, um, I think that the way that art is often integrated uh, into all kinds of practices that we don't have this separation, which is even artificial in the so-called Western world uh, between um, visual products and other types of products. Whereas in almost most of the so-called traditional cultures that uh, we look at in my class, like that separation doesn't exist. It's not even imaginable. Um, so I think that's an excellent question. I'd like to talk um, to Aliyah Yami. Um, that would be really cool to be able to hear what they have to say um, about this and maybe have them come and speak in my class. Oh, and there's one thing I wanted to mention before I go to the other questions. I thought it was really cool um, that uh, Aki was talking about the library because I'm taking the class that I'm talking about to the library today, as Becca knows. Um, and I think that kind of thing is very important, kind of introduce them. And then the mood board I thought was so great. I want to figure out a way I can steal that because my, my kid who's 20 uses a similar thing to like kind of support her own work. Um, she does it on Pinterest. So I thought that was really fascinating. I'm going to steal that and got to pick your brain about that, Aki. Great. Thanks so much, Russell. I also um, really loved seeing the example of the mood board, and it's great to hear how that can be potentially implemented in different disciplines. Um, Vince, I see your hands raised. I'm going to get through the questions in the chat, and then I will hand it off to you. So um, Ben asked a question, and I would open this up to um, either Russell or Aki about the term um, andragogy and you know, why, why we're continuing to use the term pedagogy um, since andragogy is referring to adult students. So I don't know if either of you um, are able to speak to this, but I would open that up. Um. Okay, sounds good. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm again, like I said, I'm not um, I'm, I'm not a big a big fan, honestly, uh, of of any kind of um, kind of a stamps on 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 uh, things. Uh, so maybe your definition is better. I don't know. I think somebody smarter than me can answer that. Um, Brandy actually put a response in the chat which says it's mostly an awareness thing um and the field of education hasn't fully adopted the term yet so thanks brandy for jumping in on that um there's another question that 
Ian had asked in the chat, and then I'm going to turn it over to Vince. Um, and Aki, I think this question is for you. Um, Ian's interested in knowing how the 3D prototyping work is documented as knowledge. Well, we uh, the, the the really important actually it's in the rubric uh, for the studio classes that students have to document their process. So there is a student uh, documentation of of uh, development and prototyping, and how that's used um, as a stories for knowledge. Well, it's um, it's it's in the files, uh, but. Yes, and we we do we do document it all uh, for sure. Uh, as as far as you know, keeping the actual objects, this is a this is a bit problematic. Um, we just don't have the space. As with you know, trans students, we encourage the students to take uh, as much as they can um, home with them when they graduate or when they're done with the semester. But as you go through our department, it's full of samples and great samples that students have left behind, so they make nice um you know items for the for the for the studio great thank you um vince hope you're still muted vince okay there we go i just wanted to you know <clears throat> add on and i put it in the chat you know the greeks didn't have a word for art either art is an 18th century european construct whose utility may be over. I mean, in my art history, Western art history class, we read Ray Raymond Williams' keyword on the evolution of the word art. And now we talk about visual culture, which I think in the, in the context of CCS makes more sense because a lot of what's being done at CCS does not fit that, that uh, connotation. And there is a cultural hierarchy associated with that word, which is why art practice got rid of the term fine art. Right. And so, you know, I have students in my class who are in ceramics, they're in illustration, and what they're doing is all valid. And so um, I just in making the pitch that that I think that that's um, an important thing for us to recognize. So, but that's if so, Raymond Williams has a book, Keywords, look up the definition of art, and you'll see the evolution of it. <clears throat> Great. Thanks so much, Vince. Natural beauty. Okay. Thanks. Bye. No, you're you're good. Thanks, <laughs> Um, So I'm not seeing other questions in the chat. Feel free to add them in or raise your hand. I actually have a question for both of our speakers in the meantime, which is, um, you know, a lot of what we talk about can be that students have a fear of failure um, when it comes to doing work in the classroom, they want to, you know, be perfect, they want to get it right the first time. So I guess I would ask, how do you encourage um, risk taking in your classroom, or, you know, helping students to overcome that fear of failure to really make, you know, big gains in their knowledge building? Um, I can take this one. Uh, okay, thanks. That's why I organized the first assignment. Um, and the way that I do where they have zero preparation, because the first thing I want to do, it's almost like exercising a muscle. I want them to start exercising that muscle. Uh, and I tell them like, I'm not telling you anything about this. So whatever you say, if you're wrong, it really doesn't matter. Um, I'm just trying to get you to like, start to, to use your tools to analyze art. Um, and throughout the class, that's what I'm trying to do is go, you know, kind of low, um, cost types of, of assignments um, and trying to take them step by step so that um, the issue of confidence or afraid to not get things right um, can like wither away to a certain extent. I mean, then again, though, I had a student beforehand that was, was like, I don't know what to do for the research paper I'm doing the library assignment next week. And so I talked to them individually. So, I mean, even with the types of assignments we're doing where I'm trying to make it as unintimidating as possible, it's it's still pretty tricky. Um, I think, I'm not sure what else to say other than that's probably a relationship to how we should think about education in general. Um, the trial by fire of education that I certainly went through probably isn't the best way uh, to do what we need to do. 
Thanks, Russell. Akni, do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we work in a notoriously horrible industry where people are not very nice. Uh, a lot of people are, but some are not so nice. And you just, you know, I have personal experiences working in um, design offices where I've been told how horrible my work is. And you just can't run to the bathroom and cry. You just have to kind of like understand like what do they really want and, you know, get over it. And with with our students, um, it, this is uh, this is something I've been thinking. One of our uh, adjuncts, actually, in the presentations last week, midterm presentation, she she asked the students uh, also to present errors, like what did and what were the errors they made and what they learned from it. So I think this is a really good way to um, kind of a, make students be friends with their failures. Um, I did a whole um, monologue. Uh, it was a shocking situation in in uh, Italy. I was asked to speak in a theater, which I thought it's going to be few people there. There were like hundreds. It was like an open mic and just talk about all the failures of life and how it has really made me what I am today. So again, you know, failures it can be a really beautiful thing. You just have to kind of be friends with that. We had a great um, presentation with uh, Ian and um, Melanie for one of the. Um, uh, Fulbright uh, scholars uh, who are who chose our institution to study uh, their MA and his table half of it almost was the failed attempts and they were so beautiful um, sorry to use the word art but they almost looked like this sort of a, I should say visual visually beautiful object so I think it's just um, I think um, I'm, I'm gonna have to work on this a bit more but I think just make failures your friend and uh something that can feed feed you great thanks so much i love that making failure your friend can um, i add one more thing oh I yeah this please question? yep because i think it's, it's kind of important to recognize that a lot of students are on scholarship um and uh, wouldn't be able to even remotely be able to afford the class and sometimes scholarships are based on grades um, so failure, I think we have to recognize that failure is an existential threat for some students. Um, and it's not something that we can like, like, I think it's important to make friends with failure. Like I was kind of glad I played baseball when I was a kid because you fail a lot and that means you're good. Um, but I think we have to recognize that some students are in situations where uh, failure is not an option, or at least one that they can imagine. Yeah, thanks for um, bringing up that important point. And I think um, Ian put in the chat, if a project does not entail failure, it is a failed project. And so I think, you know, it could be about working through that failure to get to the end point that you're talking about, right? Not necessarily like having a failed grade. Um, and then Annie also said, thank you. That's important to recognize. Um, we have time for about one more question. I don't know um, if anyone has any other questions for our speakers. Ian, do you have a question? I see you've unmuted. Oh, no. Okay, no, no problem. Um, okay, great. So um, thanks everyone for attending today's lecture. Um, I really enjoyed hearing from both of our speakers. I'm going to turn it back over to Brooke to just share a few details um, about the last um, faculty professional development lecture of the semester, which will be in November. Thanks, Becca. And thank you, Aki and Russell. Thank you, everyone else for attending today. Please, I invite you to join us for the last talk of the fall semester, Tuesday, November 15th, from 11.30 to 12.30, same time, same place, uh, for Student Voices, a student panel, where we'll hear from five students about their experiences with critique, mentorship, and what it takes to be academically successful at CCS.